Hello, everyone, and welcome to this conversation today. My name is Justin Reich, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Churchill Society. And my guest today is Dr. Larry Ferrero, who is an engineer, historian, and the author of several award-winning books in history, science, and technology. And Larry was the 2017 Pulitzer Prize finalist in history for his book, Brothers at Arms, American Independence, and the Men of France and Spain Who Saved It. He teaches at George Mason University in Virginia and the Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey. Um, and I'm sure Larry will be joining us shortly. Um, and here he is. And Larry, thank you very much for your time today to talk about your new book, Churchill's American Arsenal, The Partnership Behind the Innovations That Won World War II. Well, thank you for uh, welcoming me aboard. Um, and without further ado, let's begin. Yeah, and Larry, so um, just to let everyone know, Larry is setting up a, a, a presentation quickly, which he will do for 20 minutes. But I did want to let everybody know that um, please uh, submit your questions that you'd love myself and Larry to answer. Uh, we're going to spend the last 20 minutes or so of this conversation answering those questions. And we will uh, receive those questions via email. And you'll see in the chat soon the email address, but I'll tell it to, tell it to you now. It is questions at winstonchurchill.org. And lastly, we will be putting a link to purchase Larry's book in the chat as well. And I'm sure he would greatly appreciate your support. And Larry, without any further ado, please do continue. Thank you so much. So I'll go to full screen and um, I'm going to uh, also turn off my camera so that uh, it doesn't really interfere. Uh, as soon as we get it up, uh, there's a, a lot of, uh, there are many claims as to what uh, what invention, what weapon, uh, what tactic, what strategy, what uh, was the uh, key to winning the Second World War. And any one of these inventions and weapons that you see here on the screen could be credited with turning the tide. Um, most famous, uh, the most famous attribution was uh, Lee Dubridge, who was the head of the MIT Radiation Laboratory, which developed radar, who said um, the atomic bomb only ended the war, radar won it. Now, of course, he had um, a horse in that race of, of the war-winning weapon, but many other uh, examples are shown here. The P-51 Mustang with the British Merlin engine, the Liberty ship, the landing ship tank, uh, etc. Any one of these might have uh, been key to turning the tide of the war, but what they all have in common is that they were the product of a special relationship between British and American scientists, engineers, and workers. And this talk, I'm only going to focus on three of these many, many uh, examples and many stories, specifically airborne radar, the landing ship tank, and the atomic bomb, because in each of those, Churchill himself was personally involved. And these stories together will tell the overall narrative of how Britain and America forged a scientific alliance, a special relationship that was unlike any in the past. In 1940, in June, uh, Hitler's forces had already swept across Europe, and they threatened to cut off the sea lanes of the Atlantic. It was a lightning defeat of both France uh, and their armies and the British Expeditionary Force. It left tens of thousands of British weapons abandoned or destroyed in and around the beaches of Dunkirk, as you can see at the bottom left. They certainly were able to evacuate well over 300,000 British and other allied troops, but the material needed to retake Europe was left in, uh, in pieces and in tatters in Europe. So it was only by combining this engineering and scientific ingenuity of Britain and the United States in order to develop not just existing weapons, but new uh, weapons and new inventions. That was the only way that they could hope to turn the tide of war 
retake the European continent and finish the job. Churchill had just become prime minister at this point in the war. And he understood that Britain, in order to rebuild its military, in order to retake Europe, could not do so without American assistance. And he called on Roosevelt to supply existing weapons, but more importantly, he asked for a complete and open exchange of scientific and technical ideas and information with the Americans. And that exchange became the foundation for the special relationship in science and engineering that would create these innovations to win the war. Now, convincing the Americans, which were who were just coming out of a peacetime depression, the help with the British war effort was always going to be an uphill fight. And you can see this at the top left, um, the, the comparison between two large construction projects that were happening simultaneously in 1939. The left-hand towers um, look very similar to the right-hand tower, but the left-hand towers were in fact uh, part of the British chain home radar system, which was the British air defense against the German Luftwaffe. In New York, on the other hand, on the right side, what you're looking at is the Trilon Tower, which was the centerpiece of the New York World's Fair, which was uh, the symbol of America's industrial might. And that's where the world of tomorrow was brimming with household gadgets, um, mostly electric and electronic, and almost no mention of war. About this uh, time, Churchill was thinking about and eventually authorized the Tizard mission, um, which uh, would bring the scientific and technical knowledge that Britain had been developing over the course of 10 years of preparing for war and uh, one to two years of actually fighting war to the United States. It was led by Henry Tizard. That's the man in the pinstripe suit in the middle, um, who was one of British uh, Britain's top scientists. The British scientists uh, brought with them to the shores of the United States in September 1940, their crown jewels, the inventions that they had been developing, at the top, um, uh, and, and at its top was the cavity magnetron, which you see at the bottom left. And you can also see both Izzard and the man to his right, um, Lee Dubridge, head of the MIT Radiation Laboratory, holding examples. The cavity magnetron we all know today, it's actually at the heart of every microwave oven. Um, it effectively um, reduces that huge chain home radar system that you see to a size that uh, would fit into an aircraft. Today, it's a common household item, but at the time, this was cutting edge technology. And more importantly, it allowed uh, bombers and fighters to see their targets uh, using radar um, in the dark, through clouds, and even um, uh, uh, in, in total obscurity in order to be able to operate uh, inside Europe at long distances. The Americans realized how important um, the cavity magnetron would be to air warfare. And that's when they established the radiation laboratory at MIT. The cavity magnetron, in fact, was the birth of uh, what became MIT's um, military industrial partnership and elevated its stock in uh, the ministry in, in the uh, America's defense ecosystem. MIT took the cavity magnetron and working hand in hand with British scientists who stayed behind, they improved it, they developed it, and they contracted with Bell Telephone factories to produce tens of thousands of these magnetrons for radars that were used on both sides of the Atlantic by both British and American forces. It wasn't simply the case of America building British inventions. Uh, even before it had entered the war, the United States had established what was known as the Office of Scientific Research and Development, or OSRD, to mobilize American scientists and engineers to create new weapons. 
and it established uh, very early a mission in London. That's the top left, the OSRD London mission, with people working uh, in very cramped spaces, cheek by jowl. That became the focal point for scientific cooperation between uh, the two countries, coordinating R&D activities. Uh, OSRD also established what was called the British branch of the Radiation Laboratory, BBRL, um, side by side with Britain's telecommunications research establishment. That's where the British were developing their radar. And the Americans had their shops right next door, and they were working side by side uh, to develop, test, and deploy this, these latest radars. Probably one of the most important um, results of this cooperation came out as what was alternately called the H2S, which stood for Home Sweet Home, or H2X radars, and that's what you see um, underneath the B-17 bombers here. They were carried by both um, British and American bombers, Lancasters and, and Flying Fortresses and other bombers, in order to see targets on the ground at night or even through overcast, meaning bombing through clouds. Churchill himself was one of the um, most important uh, advocates for radar because he pointed out that before troops could invade the continent of Europe, bombers were, and I'm quoting him, the only means of inflicting damage on the enemy. And in fact, Churchill made certain that the um, technology research establishment uh, was carrying out uh, its its activities by appointing a special envoy to look over the shoulders of all these British scientists and engineers. Uh, this was very effective. Uh, after the war, German officials admitted that radar-directed bombings had in fact caused the breakdown of their armaments industry. Churchill also knew that bombers were the means of getting to the next step, but not the only, but not the uh, the the end of um, the. Uh, it was a prelude. Let me let me put it that way to a reconquering of the European continent. For that, they needed to invade the European shores, and in order to do so, Churchill recognized that they needed to have tanks and artillery and other heavy equipment land on the beaches in order to begin the campaign. Uh, in October 1940, this was not very long after Dunkirk, which had left, as I had mentioned, um, many thousands of tons of equipment on the shores. Um, Churchill was in a meeting in his underground bunker at, and you can see here, the Down Street tube station. This was temporary uh, war rooms. Uh, and he told the Navy the Royal Navy, that they should develop a ship that could carry um, tanks and other heavy equipment across an ocean. So it had to be deep enough to, to cross an ocean. Uh, but it also had to be shallow enough so that it could land tanks on the shores and begin the invasion. So these very first landing ship tanks, LSTs, were designed by the man on the right, Roland Baker of the Royal Corps of Naval Constructors. The problem was Britain couldn't build them in sufficient numbers. Its shipyards were over uh, capacity with new builds of destroyers, repairs of ships that had been damaged. So the Royal Navy went shopping to the United States for a new landing ship, but only with a single sheet of paper that would define what it needed. So in November of 1941, that single sheet of paper arrived in Washington, D.C. It was a short dispatch uh, outlining what Britain needed in a landing ship tank. Uh, a ship that could be uh, capable of making 10 knots, travel 10,000 nautical miles, could carry about 500 tons load, which was about 20 tanks, and had a landing draft at the... At the um, at the bow of five feet so it could put tanks onto a beach. That single sheet of characteristics was handed to the man on the left, John C. Niedermayer, who was the head of preliminary design um, of ships. And it came into his office on a Tuesday at 2 o'clock p.m. And by 4.30 p.m., 
he had completed his first sketch of an LST. That's what you see at the top right. Uh, and I mentioned that he had to leave uh, on time at 4.30 because he was uh, in a carpool. Um, cars were uh, and, and gasoline were already being restricted. And the person who rode in his carpool, Lieutenant Commander Hyman Rickover, later of nuclear um, power fame, uh, was even at that time a stickler for punctuality. So after dinner, Niedermayer took that little sketch that you see, went up to his study in his, um, in his home, uh, sketched a much larger drawing, which was uh, uh, rolled up, sent by courier to uh, Britain and approved within a week. Uh, it all happened very fast. Uh, Britain placed an order for 200 of these ships. But by, so this happened in November of 1941. By December, the United States was fully in the war and the Americans took over the entire program. And based on Niedermayer's sketch, and you can see that the final LST as, as built was very similar um, to the original sketch, uh, the United States built over a thousand LSTs in shipyards that sprang up almost uh, instantly along the Mississippi and the Ohio rivers. Unfortunately, Britain only got a hundred of those um, ships. Most were taken up by the, the Americans. Now I'm going to take this opportunity to point out that the story of the LST for me is, is personal because I was trained as a naval architect, as a warship designer, by the very people who learned at the knees of John Niedermeyer, uh, Niedermeyer here, and Roland Baker here, because I was trained both in Britain and the United States. And those people who trained um, shared their stories of these two men with me, as did the family of uh, John Niedermeyer. And I personally was involved in the design of one of the uh, descendants of the LST, uh, a new amphibious ship that's been now in service called the LPD-17. So I understood the process and I could feel this story unfold on a personal level. Most of you know, um, the Allies uh, pulled off some of the greatest amphibious operations ever during the war in Sicily and Italy and across the Pacific. But from the time that the first LSTs began traveling down the Mississippi River, and you notice the date, December 1942, it took just a year for the program to go from a sketch to a fully functioning ship um, getting ready for operations. Um, there were never enough LSTs for all the operations around the world. Uh, D-Day was put off twice because of lack of LSTs. Uh, Churchill himself said later in his history of the Second World War, um, and I'm quoting here, uh, in this period of the war, all great strategic combinations of the Western powers were restricted and distorted by the shortage of tank landing craft. The letters LST, landing ship tank, are burnt on the minds of the military all turned upon the LSTs. But that's not quite what he said in the heat of the moment. At the very top is a, a telegram that he sent to George Marshall in April 1944, as always, um, much saltier and to the point um, and much more direct than what he later wrote in his, um, in his memoirs. And don't forget that these goddamn things called LSTs were Churchill's own idea in the first place. Meanwhile, in a separate development, um, Britain had begun studying the atomic bomb as early as 1940 after a series of experiments showed that it could be feasible. Churchill himself authorized a, um, an atomic bomb program called Tube Allies in 1940. And this was the very first atomic bomb program ever um, it included uh, eminent British uh, physicists, uh, as you see here uh, on left. Um, they were from both Britain and Eastern Europe, Eastern European scientists, 
had fled the Nazis and found an, a welcoming home in Britain. It was in May 1941, this was before the Americans had actually entered the war, that they uh, received quite secretly the memorandum from the Tube Alloys Project stating that the atomic bomb was feasible. And in fact, it was those findings from these British scientists that helped start the Manhattan Project, which ultimately developed the atomic bomb. And that project relied quite extensively on the direct participation of British scientists from two alloys, including the men you see here at the left. Um, they were working everywhere from Los Alamos to Berkeley to Oak Ridge. Uh, many of them, in fact, held leadership roles, and they were present throughout the project. In fact, one of them, a British scientist, Otto Frisch, who was, in fact, a refugee from Austria, was present at the Trinity test site in New Mexico when the very first atomic bomb was detonated. And you can see his quote afterwards, where he said, fearing to be dazzled and burned, I stood with my back to the gadget and behind the radio truck. I looked at the hills, which were visible in the first faint light of dawn. The bomb exploded about 5.30 in the morning. Suddenly and without any sound, the hills were bathed in a brilliant light, as if somebody had turned the sun on with a switch. As Vannevar Bush, the head of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, OSRD, that I mentioned before, um, and that was the organization that led the scientific alliance between the British and the Americans, um, noted, and you can see the quote here, that most of the game-changing weapons uh, of the Second World War had yet to be invented when the war began. It was only by combining the talents of British and American scientists and engineers that these weapons were brought to the fore. In fact, the head of the OSRD London office later said, Britain's scientific mobilization of the war for the war was impressive. And America's engineering capabilities proved fully adequate to support those contributions. We, the Americans, were therefore able to adopt and benefit greatly from British ideas. And I point out that it's a, the ability of the United States to adopt and benefit from the best ideals, ideas from around the world that allowed it to lead this alliance of nations to victory in the Second World War. And now I'm going to turn it over to Justin for Very questions. Good. Yeah, thank and you, Larry. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing the screen for now. Larry, thank you. I can see why uh, uh, students enjoy probably taking your classes. I was very well, uh, not, just, not just well done, but very well told. Um, so as you were talking, I, I wrote down quite a few questions. Um, we are receiving others from attendees, and I'd like to encourage attendees to continue to submit your questions uh, to our email address, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, Larry, I, I think, well, first off, I love that Churchill quote, because like you said, oftentimes <laughs> the quotes from Churchill are a little more direct. They're a little more um, not not as, uh, uh, you know, not as... Um, uh, shall we say, uh, inclusive of many people's opinions, <laughs> as, as as oftentimes as, he, as he's told. Um, but let me first ask, you know, this book is incredibly well-researched. Um, and in my way, here for everyone uh, watching, this is the cover, and I've enjoyed reading it immensely. Let me ask you, which I always enjoy asking guests, what is an assumption that you had going into your research? What maybe assumption that you were writing the book on? that was challenged through the research and, and, and what was the process of, of, you know, coming to that assumption no longer being applicable? Well, thank you, Justin. I, and uh, the, the beginning of my uh, project uh, uh, was subtitled uh, How the United States Built the British Inventions that Won World War II. On the assumption, my mistaken assumption, that uh, Britain had come up most of these war-winning ideas and, and inventions and weapons, and the United States just built them. 
But as I dove into the records and the archives and the letters, I was very happy to see that um, to get uh, actual letters and uh, and and uh, other documents from the grandchildren of some of the participants who found them in in the attic, literally uh, finding out uh, from one of the uh, family members, I have a trunk in the attic full of letters. Would you like to see it? Which is something that you you read about in in novels but it never happens except it actually did and those uh uh primary source documents and other um uh, uh information very quickly showed me that it was not simply the united states building what the british had come up with it was a uh, very much a cooperative effort between the two nations and more specifically between the people in the nations each side had a very um frankly dim view of the other side in terms of <laughs> capabilities um certainly britain had the wartime experience and and there's no denying that they'd been preparing to fight germany for over a decade they'd actually been fighting germany for several years so they had the experience behind them but when you compare the or if you think about the um uh the the level of um knowledge and just the sheer raw talent between the two sides they were every bit equal each side had um their share of geniuses veritable geniuses very good managers very hard workers and each side was completely and totally dedicated um comparing just the work ethics of the people from each one of the uh different laboratories or uh, factories um they were in this uh, the phrase shoulder to shoulder is is applicable so i went from thinking that um we just built um what other people came up with to realizing just how um how entwined our two nations and the people were so you know one of the things that struck me about your book is um you know, understanding that this cooperation, the sharing of ideas, the ability to assist Britain, um, didn't didn't just have a hard start date. You know, I think most people who who understand the Battle of Britain or or interested in and interested in America's entry into the war post December seventh, nineteen forty one, I feel like there's a a, a miss leading narrative that says the united states if not for franklin roosevelt you know pushing through lend lease and single-handedly assisting the british in whatever way possible um then um, you know america didn't do anything to help whereas your book really kind of just you know it, it dispels that notion in a way and i i think of um the international society had its conference in london in 2021 and we met a british bomber who pilot, bomber pilot, who learned how to fly planes over the Gulf of Mexico in early 1940. So, um, you know, what's your reaction to that sense of kind of a strict historical narrative of May 1940, Dunkirk, Battle of Britain, Lend-Lease, Pearl Harbor, bang, the United States is in the, is in the war. That's certainly not what happened. You've said it as, as well as anybody. Um, it was it was gradual, and that's for uh, and and that um, was the product of the fact that uh, the United States uh, um, population was very reluctant to be what it saw as dragged back into a European war. So um, Roosevelt, uh, especially before his election in November 1940 had to walk this tightrope of not wanting to alienate a pretty substantial anti-war population and knowing that the future of the united states was deeply intertwined with what was happening in europe i always point out that um the united states uh, came to uh, western europe's aid um because it saw uh, over time that its own national interest was at stake and no nation ever goes to war 
or even provides material for war unless it sees a direct national interest. So there were pockets, and I'm, I really like the story that you gave of the British pilot um, who, along with many other pilots, was being trained in the United States. And I um, remind me, uh, this is a little uh, a bit of a, an aside from the book, but um, one of my friends that um, I got to know over the course of many years had been uh, in, uh, in, in the United States trained for uh, the same, uh, you know, the same way as a pilot, but he became part of the, he started with as part of the French resistance. He escaped um, uh, France over the Pyrenees to Spain, came to the United States and was trained in, in Alabama um, uh, to become a pilot and then went back to fight with uh, the British and the Americans and then the French contingents um, in order to uh, you know battle with uh, the the Nazis, and it turned out that people from all over Europe, Poland, and many other places were were getting trained very early on, and then throughout the war in the United States. Um, I I find that 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 level of um, uh, interchange, uh, you know, to be just absolutely fascinating because it didn't just happen. On the front line, it didn't just happen in the science and the technology. It happened across the entire uh, spectrum of warfare. Uh, Larry, can you, you know, you're, a, you're an engineer, so you can probably appreciate the time it takes um, a factory to be retooled to, to go from consumer products to war material. But can you tell us, you know, through your research and when writing this book, were you, were you astounded by how quickly factories such as Carrier, Packard, Ford could could refocus on war material versus consumer material? Gobsmacked. Absolutely gobsmacked. Um, I spent much of my career in the Defense Department, um, mostly naval side, uh, looking at timelines that were measured in many years and decades. And to read the stories of how this particular factory retooled in, in a matter of months, or, and this is one of my favorite stories, um, how the Kaiser shipyards, um, and Henry Kaiser was a, a, a civil engineer, he was, he was famous for the Hoover Dam. Um, when the British came over uh, in 1940, because they needed Liberty ships, uh, he sold them on the idea that he could build them. And, and he was not a shipbuilder, um, but he knew how to build shipyards. Um, in fact, I, the great story, and this is absolutely true, is uh, uh, one of his uh, workers uh, asked the question, when do we pour the keel? And for those of you who don't know, you pour a cement foundation for building, but you lay a keel for a ship. So <laughs> very different. But Kaiser, once the British um, put, uh, put their contracts in place, um, within the space of two weeks, had already driven uh, the piles to lay the foundations for the shipyard in Richmond, California. Within six weeks, the um, building ways for the ships were going up. And within eight months, ships were being built and starting to come off the shipbuilding ways. It, this is not something you would ever see um, today. I, I know that many of us are following the news of the war in Ukraine, and yeah. one of the continual questions is, how long does it take to ramp up um, weapons production? And when you look at the stories of what happened in World War II, um, you realize that, yes, it's possible to um, turn your shoulder um, to the effort and move very quickly, but it takes an entire national um, effort in order to do so. So. Your question, was I surprised? Uh, it, it, the answer is absolutely. And I'm still surprised um, to this day as I read through these accounts. Can you tell us the story of, in your book, of um, two, two very important items of cargo that were transported to Canada but aboard the HMS Revenge? What were those two items? 
Um, and how did they, you know, what were their unique stories? So I'm, I'm, I'm talking, of course, about some something on paper and something much heavier. So actually, um, uh, it wasn't just paper. So HMS Revenge was a battleship. And uh, let me uh, let me go back. I'm going to share the screen again, and I'm going to go back to yeah. the first slide because uh, there's two things that I want to point out. Um, just give me one second while I yeah. do the share screen. And so here, and I'll uh, go to full screen, but I'll keep my camera on. So you should see full screen. So on the left, you can yeah. see um, uh, Churchill walking in front of, and that turns out to be the first edition of the P-51 Mustang. Um, it was ordered by Britain in 1940 um, as a low-level fighter. That's what they needed, something that was a good dogfighter. Um, North American Aviation built it in uh, first model in 100 days. Um, they shipped it to Britain. They liked it. Um, the problem, uh, and, and that's why I happen to like this photograph, because everybody thinks of the P-51 Mustang as an all-American fighter, but the British bought it. The British gave the specifications. There was a British aerodynamicist who helped with the design. Um, it really was a British American product. Um, as the airplane went into service, Britain realized that it needed much more, um, a much more uh, high level uh, escort bomber, uh, escort fighter, sorry, that could uh, take on um, German planes uh, uh, escorting bombers at very high altitudes. But the engine, um, it was an Allison engine, uh, simply wasn't designed for that. But there was a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine that powered the Spitfires that was perfectly adequate. So what you see here on the top right is a P-51 Merlin Mustang. And that Merlin engine was what Britain knew it needed, but it, its own factories were being bombed and uh, they, they could not produce them in the quantities necessary. And so almost on the spur of the moment, um, Britain uh, asked Rolls-Royce to pack up the plans for the Merlin engine, pack up one engine and ship it to the United States. And they did so uh, right away without even asking about um, licensing or patent rights or anything like that. This was what was called the shadow factory um, system where the main factory was producing um, the, uh, the weapons and the materiel, but they also set up satellite factories that could be used as uh, to augment production. And this was a satellite factory. They wanted these shadow factories in the United States quickly. Now, I want to, before I explain what went on HMS Revenge, um, I want to point out that it was Britain's establishment of shadow factories in the United States and its ordering of um, uh, weapons of war that jump-started the American defense economy, which had been lying moribund for almost a decade and shaved about two years off of the production time it would have taken. So British dollars, well, British gold, um, actually paid for um, America's retooling and resurgence. That gold came aboard ships like HMS Revenge, a battleship, where they loaded about 500 tons of bullion for safekeeping. Um, and Revenge and other battleships and other troop ships were shuttling gold from the reserves in the Bank of uh, England and in Liverpool out of the reach of the Nazis and putting them in the banks of Canada and the United States. And that gold was being used to pay for production. Well, on one of those ships, Revenge, um, came not just gold bullion, but crates of um, parts for the uh, Merlin engine, as well as the plans for the Merlin. And in secret, it went um, to very quickly to, to Canada. Docked in Halifax and the... Um, the, the head of the bank of um, the, uh, the Canadian bank that was um, getting the gold bullion was also told, go pick up the plans for the Merlin engine and bring them to the United States. He got this in a secret cable. So he came with his briefcase, came aboard the ship, and it turned out they hadn't just given him a set of just a couple of plans, but it was an entire 
engine that had been disassembled and crated. And, and, you know, he's standing there with his briefcase. Very long story told very quickly. Those plans, that engine, were all sent to Detroit. And eventually Packard Motor um, took the uh, um, took the contract by the United States to build these engines for the British. As it happened, um, simultaneously, America was building the Mustangs. And when um, a very uh, a forward-thinking pilot realized that the Merlin engine would fit very well in the Mustang airframe, and it would uh, be a much better aircraft because of that, the Merlin Mustang was born, and um, they were shipped to Britain um, in this uh, in in this configuration. And I think Packard eventually um, created some twenty thousand um, engines by the time they were they were finished. It was it was an amazing effort. Can I ask a, a, a hopefully not um, too junior of a question? But if I'm working in metric if my plans are in metric and i go to imperial i mean there must have been some you know i don't want to call it deciphering but you know making sure that hey this is actually you know seven inches instead of x you know millimeters or something like that did you come across any of that in your research or any sort of like you know shall we say cultural differences as as church always said uh um to uh, I'm paraphrasing two countries separated by a shared language that that was attributed to George Bernard Shaw who never actually that's said right. it but yeah, he should have right. but that's he right. should have Excuse said me. that and engineers in the United States and Britain don't speak the same language and having been trained in both countries I can tell you that um and certainly the drawings and plans were not um at all similar you know Britain was using imperial units the United States was using um you know standard Unit. So yeah. uh, one inch in Britain was a little bit different. So the drawings not only had somewhat different scales, and Americans were used to that. They, they, that wasn't such a bad, um, that wasn't a big uh, 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 leap because they, they had tooled uh, uh, over many years for export. The problem was that in Britain, most um, people who worked in the engineering shops, the, the actual designers, had been trained on the on the shop floor they 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 came up um doing machining and and tooling before they ever became engineers so when they would draw up a plan for an engine um many details were left off it would just say to shop practice and and everybody understood that because they all spoke the same language ah, it was american kind of engineers institutional yeah. knowledge institutional knowledge was 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 part and parcel of british uh, engineering and i can tell you that i saw this day to day when I was trained in, in Britain. But as an American engineer, you come up usually through university, your time in the shop is probably very limited. Every single detail had to be spelled out. So when the Americans got the British plans, and this literally happened, they would get um, a package of, of 80 drawings for, for, for an engine. And they say, no, we wanted the whole package. And they said, this is the whole package. And they said, well, it would take us 500 drawings to, to do this and they had to take these British um you know these these British plans measure every piece on the engine redraw it and that took months to retool I can only imagine my goodness yes and and oh by the way just to be clear the Merlin engine especially was never built for mass production they had so many different types of screws and and bolts and and fasteners the Americans said, "We can't do this. We're gonna we're gonna standardize on one," and so there were many other changes. And and for me as an engineer, as you said, this was wonderful to read um, these accounts. That uh, you know yeah. was was something I encountered day to day, and now I'm seeing that it actually affected the way the war um, was was waged. Well, Larry, let's get to some questions. Um, the first is. Um, regarding the third leg of the Allied stool, did the U.S. and Britain explicitly agree to exclude the Soviet Union from development of warfare technologies? And second question, how successful were Russian espionage efforts into getting themselves into related R&D? I mean, I think we know the story with uh, the Manhattan Project in terms of Russian espionage. 
But from your research, did you come across any of these things? Well, um, it didn't uh, dwell on the uh, espionage in the Manhattan Project, although um, I do know that um, the um, uh, Ethel and Julia um, Rosen. Rosen, sorry? Rosenberg. Rosenberg um, began not by uh, selling secrets for, to the, to the uh, Soviet Union for the atomic bomb, but rather for another invention called the proximity fuse, which That's I talked about right. extensively. That's right. In, yeah. In my in my book, um, when the, the the Soviet Union came hat in hand looking for um, additional um, uh, weaponry, it did get um, a lot of commercial off the shelf um, uh, equipment. They would call, uh, and please hold on for one second. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I don't like to cough on camera. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fair they, they, they received a lot of off-the-shelf products. They received um, uh, trucks. They received aircraft. They were not directly involved in any of the um, uh, development. The United States certainly kept that very close to the chest. And in only a few limited circumstances did um, the Soviets get any um, more advanced technology one of uh, one of example of which was called identification friend or foe IFF, which allowed the Allied aircraft to yeah. signal to Allied radar, "We're not enemy, don't shoot us." Um, but mostly, the United States uh, kept uh, those kinds of things, and and as did Britain, very close to the vest. I, another question. Um... They, they ask the special relationship is responsible for all, many of these inventions, but inventions, but it did seem to have limits in their thinking of um, the bomb and, and Enigma. Can you speak to the limitations of the uh, this this cooperation and where where you know some tensions arose? Uh, there were tensions almost um, from the from the start. How much do we want to so the for the from the American side, it was how much of our um, uh, equipment and ideas do we want to give to Britain, especially uh, on, you know, if they are about to be overrun by the Germans. Mm -hmm. Now, when uh, Britain was able to successfully fend off the Blitz and it became apparent that German Germany was not going to uh, invade Britain, some of that tension um, led up. But there was still a real question about how much of uh, America's secrets could be uh, divulged to Britain. So the Manhattan Project did not start off as this wonderful open arm, we're going to exchange things with you relationship. Um, in fact, uh, there was a, a, a lot of tension, especially between Churchill and Vannevar Bush over um, access to uh, secrets. But eventually they came to an accommodation where they were able to um, exchange information on some very particular aspects of the development, specifically the separation of uranium-238 and 235, which Britain had, had pioneered, but they left other parts um, uh, off limits. Uh, for example, the, uh, the development of plutonium, I believe, was not something that was well shared. I... I uh, I know there, there was some, but uh, there were things that were just kept off limits. Now, Enigma, I'm glad you brought, brought that up because one of the things that was absolutely fascinating in my book is we've all seen the imitation game. And for narrative purposes, um, Benedict Cumberbatch um, single-handedly decodes, uh, uh, along with Kira Knightley, decodes yeah. all of the British, uh, all of the German intercepts, except that most of the Enigma machines by... 1944 were built in the United States by National Cash Register. Yes, that's the same National Cash Register that you see in your 7-Eleven. Wow. And the decoding and decrypting was not done by the women in Bletchley Park. It was being done by the women at the uh, Navy Communications Center in Washington, D.C. Um, wow. The Wrens, that's what they were called, would um, send the Enigma um, uh, uh, 
uh, messages that they had uh, uh, gotten by undersea cable to um, the United States, where the waves, those are the women, would decrypt the messages and send them back. And these machines, by the way, they were based on Alan Turing's design, but improved. So they were actually better than the original Turing design. The other thing I like to point out is, notice who I said did the intercepts and did the decryption, wrens and waves. Yes, the women did the work and the men got the credit. Yeah. Well, let's end with um, one last slide that I know you wanted to share. So um, thank you. Um, what I'm uh, about to show you is a question that uh, I haven't, uh, didn't hear, but I, I, I was kind of hoping I would. And that is, I love technology when it works. It's working. And that's, what about Mary Churchill? And uh, she actually was uh, crucial to getting a particular weapon into the war. And that weapon was called Hedgehog. And here's the quick story. Um, in uh, 1941, uh, uh, there was it had already been established something called MD-1. It was Ministry of Defense 1, mm. otherwise known as Churchill's Toy Shop. And they were developing all kinds of weaponry outside of the Army and the Navy and the Royal Air Force, including this new submarine mortar, um, which eventually became what you see here at the bottom, Hedgehog. Um, and they were trying to get Churchill to see it because it would solve many of the problems they were having with depth charges. Um, Churchill was meanwhile testing uh, some weapons and some armor outside of his home in Checkers. In fact, he was using that Tommy gun that you see him holding in that yeah. uh, picture. This may have actually been taken at the time, and he was firing away uh, happily. And then when um, the, the British engineers uh, asked him to look at this new anti-submarine mortar, um, he said, well, time for lunch, don't have the time. Mary Churchill, however, and remember, she was by this point um, already uh, part of the army, said, uh, we've got time to see the new weapon because she really wanted to see it in action. And she convinced her father to um, have the weapon demonstrated. Well, Churchill was so chuffed that the very next day, um, the first sea lord, Dudley Pound, rings up um, the uh, engineers developing Hedgehog and, and, and asks, how, long, how quickly can you get this aboard ships? So the Brit Britons start building these things. But of course, like with many other weapons, there wasn't the industrial capacity. So they bring the plans to the United States, and it's the Carrier Air Conditioning Corporation that takes up the construction. And by the end of the war, and you can see um, that bottom right, this is what a, uh, a, a, um, a hedgehog attack looked like. It actually fired these mortar rounds, which were miniature depth charges in front of the ship so that um, the submarine was still in sonar contact. They were deadly. And by the end of the war, you can see um, it helped to sink over 300 subs. So thanks to um, Mary Churchill, um, the uh, anti-submarine war was prosecuted uh, to its fullest. Larry, thank you for that. And, and thank you, Mary. Mary, our former patron uh, of the International Church of Society for a long time until her yes. death in 2014. One reason why I brought it up. <laughs> yes, I'm so glad you did. Um, Larry, thank you for your time. Everyone, thanks for joining us. Again, if you haven't purchased Larry's book, very entertaining, uh, especially those who have, of you who are engineer, uh, engineer minded. And we put the, the purchase link in the chat. Thank you all for your time, Larry. Take care. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.